All right, what's going on you guys? Welcome back. So in this video, we're gonna be talking about a pretty interesting geometric figure known as Gabriel's horn. What's interesting about this geometric figure is that it has a couple of properties that seem sort of contradictory with one another and its construction leads to an apparent paradox called the painter's paradox, which we'll be resolving in this video. So let's begin by defining Gabriel's horn. We'll start by drawing a Cartesian plane. Now what we're going to do is we're going to graph the function f of x equals 1 over x from 1 to infinity on this graph. So let's see what that looks like. Well notice that f of 1 is 1 over 1 which is 1 so we know the point 1 comma 1 is on the graph. So let's say that's right here. And from there as x gets large or goes to infinity f of x is going to go towards 0, it's going to tend to 0. So it's going to look something like this. So it's getting closer and closer to the x-axis as x grows larger, never crossing it and never touching it. And that continues indefinitely. Now Gabriel's horn is formed by taking this graph and rotating it through a third dimension. So we're going to get a solid of revolution. So we're looking at something like that. I never claim to be an artist. I'll probably overlay something on top of that because it looks pretty bad. Anyway, here we have Gabriel's horn. It is the solid of revolution formed by taking the graph of f of x equals 1 over x and rotating it through the third dimension forming a solid of revolution. So you can see why it gets its name. It looks like a horn. Okay, well what's so special about this little shape here? Well, it's a solid revolution, so we can find its volume and its surface area using the normal formulas for the volume and surface area of a solid revolution. So let's find the volume first. The intuition behind this formula, this integral, is that the volume of a solid revolution can be approximated by a stack of cylinders, basically. And the volume of a cylinder is given by pi r squared h. So our radius is the value of the function at a point, so 1 over x is playing the role of the radius. So we get squared multiplied by pi, and dx is playing the height of such a cylinder. And we're integrating from 1 to infinity because that's the interval where the shape is located. So let's go ahead and compute this integral. First we'll just pull out the pi and write that in a more convenient form. And now we'll take the general antiderivative of x to the minus 2. That's going to be negative x to the minus 1. Now evaluating the antiderivative at its limit points, as x gets large or tends towards infinity, negative x to the minus 1 is 0. And if we plug in 1 to this, we get negative 1. And we're subtracting that, so we end with this. pi. So we see that the volume of Gabriel's horn, the whole thing, is pi. Happy belated pi day, by the way. I should have had a video prepared for that. All right, now that we've found the volume of the horn, let's go ahead and find the surface area. As a solid of revolution, its surface area is given by the following. Now this integral is a little messy and rather hard to compute. So instead of evaluating it directly, let's just notice something. So we're multiplying 1 over x by the square root of 1 plus negative x to the minus 2 squared. Now this number is always strictly positive. So the result is that under this radical we have a number that is larger than 1 and we are multiplying that by 1 over x. So since we are multiplying a strictly larger than one number by one over x, we can say the following. This integral is larger than this one because the only difference is that here we're multiplying by a number that is larger than one. So it is bigger than this integral. And what is this integral? Well, the general antiderivative of one over x is the natural log of x. So that leaves us with this.
Now as x grows large, natural log of x also grows large, so this integral is infinite. So, Gabriel's horn has an infinite surface area and yet a finite volume. Now, at first glance, this may seem like a sort of contradictory result. A finite volume is being enclosed by an infinite surface area. Well, it's interesting, but it's not so abnormal. If you think about a two-dimensional plane, that's another shape that has a finite volume zero and an infinite surface area. It is an infinite two-dimensional plane. It has no volume because it's two-dimensional and its surface area is infinite. So on its own this is not a problem. But it is interesting. Now, this shape leads to a pretty interesting apparent paradox called the painter's paradox. Let's suppose we want to paint the inside of Gabriel's horn. Well, on one hand, the surface area is infinite. So, I would need an infinite amount of paint to paint that infinite surface area of Gabriel's horn, so I can't do it. But luckily, the volume is finite, so I can just go ahead and get myself pi liters of paint, fill the horn up, and that will paint the inside for me. So which is it? Am I able to paint the inside of Gabriel's horn with a finite amount of paint or not? How can we resolve this paradox? Are we able to paint the infinite inside surface area of Gabriel's horn with a finite amount of paint or not? On one hand, it seems like we cannot do this because that surface area is infinite. But on the other hand, the volume of it is finite, so we can just fill the horn up with that, amount of, that finite amount of paint and that will paint the surface area. But the answer can't be both. The answer can't be yes and no. So there must be some flaw in our reasoning to come to this paradox. So what is it? Well, this paradox is caused by being inconsistent about the nature of this paint itself. We have to decide, what is the nature of this paint? Is this paint mathematical in that it is a continuous substance composed of an infinitude of points? Or is it a more physical paint that is composed of particles like atoms? First, let's examine the case where the paint is more mathematical in nature. In other words, it is not composed of discrete particles or atoms or anything like that. It is just a continuous substance. Now I'm going to represent our finite volume of paint with the sphere of radius 1 in three dimensions. Now, in this case, the paradox is resolved simply because there's no issue whatsoever with this finite volume of mathematical paint covering an infinite surface area. For example, so here is my finite volume of this mathematical paint. And here is an infinite surface area, the xy plane. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover this infinite surface area with this finite volume of paint with the following function. So this function f is going to take the point xyz to xy0 times the negative natural log of 1 minus the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So this function takes this finite volume set and covers the entire infinite two-dimensional plane. It is surjective onto it. So this resolves the paradox in the case of mathematical paint. The resolution is that yes, we can paint the infinite surface area of the horn because a finite volume of this mathematical paint can cover an infinite surface area without issue. And that's because the important part is not its volume, but its cardinality as a set. These sets both have the same cardinality, and so we can find a bijective function between the two. Now let's look at the other scenario. 
What if the paint is more physical in nature? In other words, it is composed of a finite number of discrete particles. Well, in this case, I think it's pretty clear that we cannot cover an infinite surface area with a finite volume of this paint that is composed of a finite number of molecules or whatever. So the question is, can we fill the horn with this paint to paint the inside? Well, here's the issue. Remember that Gabriel's horn is continuously getting smaller and smaller. As it keeps going on, it gets smaller. So if this paint is composed of a finite number of these discrete molecules, there is a smallest molecule and eventually it will not be able to pass through the inside of Gabriel's horn. It will be too thin for one of these molecules to pass through. And since that happens after a finite length of the horn, an infinite amount of the surface area remains and only a finite surface area has been covered by this particle paint by filling up the horn. So the paradox is resolved here as well. In the case of a physical paint composed of particles, we can't even fill up the entire horn with this paint to paint it. So ultimately, the flaw in thinking that led us to this paradox was not being consistent about the properties of the paint itself. If we say that we cannot paint the infinite surface area of Gabriel's horn, then we're saying that this is a physical particle paint. But if we say that we can fill that finite volume of Gabriel's horn, then we're saying that this is a mathematical paint. If we're consistent with the paint's properties, there is no paradox. In the case of mathematical paint, yes, we can cover the infinite surface area, no big deal. And yes, we can also fill that finite volume, no big deal. If the paint is physical or made of particles, then no, we cannot paint that infinite surface area, but we cannot fill that finite volume either because eventually the horn is too narrow for any molecules to pass through and there is an infinite surface area remaining after that point. So that resolves the paradox. That's all I have for today. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe and I'll see you guys in the next one.